I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. FreeSky has released a new air protocol called Access. The air protocol is, you know how like when you bind your receiver, there's D8 or D16 mode, and you got to pick the right mode for the receiver or it won't bind? Well, Access is another iteration of that. And in this video, we're going to go over, like, what does Access even bring to the table? If you run FreeSky, should you want Access? Should you be excited about this? Should you be annoyed? And if you've got one of the new Access-capable radios, like the X9 Lite or the X Lite Pro, I'm going to show you how to use these new features, which you've never seen before. So stay tuned. Let's start the video with a rundown of what the new access protocol brings to the table compared to the older protocol, which is known as ACCST or for short D16. And one of the things access brings to the table is more channels supported. Access supports up to 24 full range channels, whereas the older D16 protocol supported only up to 16 channels. Now that's more channels than many people needed, but if you want to get a whole bunch of flight modes and a whole bunch of aux functions without screwing around with weird multiplexing things, like I, I put all my modes on one channel, but it's pretty weird and complicated. FreeSky Access Protocol gives you up to 24 channels. You just have all the channels you could possibly want without a second thought. Access also improves the latency of the connection, and this is something that FreeSky has gotten a lot of flack for, and Crossfire, for example, gets a lot of attention for. Crossfire users are very happy with their low, low latency. And when we talk about latency, it's important you know that we're not just talking about the frame timing, but the end-to-end -end latency, the delay from the moment when you move the stick to the moment when the quadcopter actually starts moving. By way of analogy, let's imagine that I sent you a letter, and I sent you one letter every day. Well, my frame timing is one letter per day but my end-to-end -end latency is how long it takes you to actually get the letter from the moment that I sent it. And you see, frame timing, it's almost not quite, it's how often the signal updates, which does matter, but end-to-end -end latency is what makes the difference between feeling like a quad is really sharp and connected versus feeling like there's, you know, a, well, the latency, delay between you moving the stick and the quad actually moving. If we look right here, we can see that FreeSky lists the latency of 8-channel mode as fixed 11 millisecond, 16-channel mode as between 14 and 23 millisecond, and 24-channel mode as between 14 and 23 milliseconds. All of these latencies are faster than the latency of FreeSky's D16 protocol, assuming that they're honest and accurate, which would require third-party testing, and I'm sure someone's going to do that eventually. Are you going to feel the latency? I fly Crossfire and I fly S bus and I fly them back to back. And I got to tell you, I don't notice a massive difference in the stick feel or the latency, but I'm just a, you know, a middle-aged old dude with no, just a freestyle pilot. You know, what do I know? I'm sure some of you hotshots out there will definitely notice the latency difference between ACCST or sorry, between access and S bus or D60. Damn it. Another thing that Access brings to the table is more sophisticated management of multiple transmitters and multiple receivers. So the simple model embraced by D16 is that you bind the receiver to the transmitter by holding down the bind button and activating binding on the transmitter, and one transmitter is bound to one receiver, and that's the end of it. But there are some problems with this. It's freaking annoying to have to press the bind button every time you want to bind. And that's especially true if you've buried the receiver up inside a quadcopter or a bigger model. Having to get at the bind button to bind is so dang annoying. Now, Crossfire addresses this. And the way they do that is if the receiver powers up and after like 10 seconds, if it doesn't have a bound link to the transmitter, it goes into binding mode. I don't know the actual time. It might not be 10 seconds. It might be 30. I don't know. What that means is that with Crossfire, if you need to bind a new transmitter to your receiver, you just plug in the quad, wait for the receiver to go into binding mode, and then turn on the transmitter and bind it. You don't have to press the button. But there's a problem with this. Anybody could bind their transmitter to your receiver. There's no validation of the transmitter. 
And the way that FreeSky addresses this is by separating the binding process into registration and binding. So first, when you're on the bench setting up the quad, building the quad, you register the, trans the transmitter to the receiver. And then afterwards, you can bind any registered transmitter to the receiver. And what that means is that you can register multiple transmitters. So by pressing the bind button, if you have spare transmitters, maybe you're a racer and you want to make sure you don't lose a race because your transmitter broke, you could register each of your transmitters to the receiver. And then if you break your transmitter in the middle of a race, you just turn the next transmitter on, bind it to the registered transmitter, and now you're controlling that quad. And that's all done wirelessly without ever touching the receiver. The other thing you could do is, let's say you're a father and son and you guys like to fly each, other, each other's models. You could register your transmitter and your son's transmitter to the same receiver. And then if your son wants to fly one of your quads, you just real quick turn it on, bind it, and you're good to go. In order to register and bind the receiver, here on the x -Lite Pro, I'm gonna hold right on the joystick until I get to the Model Select menu, then press right on the joystick one more time to get to the Setup menu. I'm gonna then press up to go around the bottom to the bottom of the menu, because that's where these options are. If I go down, it takes for freaking ever. So we'll go up, we'll come around the bottom, and we will see here the binding options. And the first thing I want you to see is that the module mode is set to ISRM. That's FreeSky's internal shorthand for access protocol. Just like, so if you look at the options here, we got ISRM, off, or D16, you f for real? I don't know why I don't see D16 here. It's supposed to support D16, but let's just tackle that problem another day. <laughs> I'm gonna go down to module and I've got two options here, register a new receiver and range check. So I'm gonna hit the enter button and register the new receiver and we're waiting now. Now I'm gonna plug in the receiver while holding down the bind button and that will register the new receiver. And having done that, we can see here that the RXSR receiver has been registered. I then hit go down and hit enter and registration OK. In order to bind the receiver, I'm gonna go down to where it says receiver one, two, three, bind, and more about the fact that there are three receivers later, but I'm gonna pick one of those and I'm gonna hit bind, and then I'm simply gonna plug in the receiver without, without holding down the bind button. And when I do that, the receiver will come on. It's coming on in bind mode. Notice that the red and the green LED are lit, and we get this option pop up, select RX, RXSR, and bind successful. We are now bound. Now let's demonstrate the utility of this by bringing the X9 light into the picture. That will conveniently also give us the option to show the same procedure using the X9 lights menus. I'm going to press the menu button one time to get to the model select page, then the page button one time to get to setup. I'm going to scroll wheel to the left to go around the bottom of the menu and come up in the binding options. I can then highlight register, just like, see, looks very similar. And I'm gonna register this receiver to this radio. Hold down the bind button, all right. It's detected the receiver, we'll hit enter, and the receiver is now registered. Or cycle the receiver here. And notice that the receiver comes up and it is blinking red LED, it's not bound. If I turn on the X light. Welcome to OpenTX, throttle warning. The receiver goes green and it's working. But I can easily power this down. I can go in the X9 light. I can say receiver one bind, waiting for RX. I power this guy on without touching any buttons or anything. I can now immediately rebind it to this radio. And it's now being controlled by this radio, not this one. Notice that this one's still powered on. I can very easily switch these back and forth simply by choosing to bind. Yeah, hmm. I mean, I guess in theory, if someone got a hold of one of your transmitters that was registered, they could steal your bind out from underneath you, but what are the chances of that? There's one more step here that you're gonna need to do, and that is when you go to register your receiver, 
you're going to need to set the registration ID to be identical on all of the radios that you will be sharing the bind with. So you can just click the button and go up and down and change this to whatever you want, but they need to have the exact same registration ID. Oh my God. <laughs> so I'll talk over the beeping here. You can see that this one has registration ID QZZ so whatever 7D and this one is R1ZZL7TE. If you were to register the same receiver with both of these radios, hold on. Okay. If you were to register the same receiver with both of these radios, it would work. But if you then switch the bind from this radio to this one, you will not be able to switch back. So if you want to be able to switch the bind back and forth from one radio to another, the radios must have the same radio ID here in the registration screen. I should also point out that if you select the receiver on the bound radio and long press the menu, there is an option to share the receiver bind with another radio. This is presumably if you want to like just let somebody else try one of your quads and you're just gonna cut, just let them have registration without having to get at your bind button. But I haven't been able to figure out how to actually make this work. Like when you do that, it starts beeping as if it's in bind mode. But then when you go into the other radio, like what do you do? It doesn't seem to like wirelessly pick up the bind somehow magically. I don't know. Yeah, so not exactly sure how that share function works and I'm not gonna research it any further right now, sorry. Another feature the access protocol brings to the table is channel remapping. I don't, I'm not sure I understand the point of this one. The idea is that if you, especially if you have a fixed wing and you plug your servos in in the wrong order, there's all, always a bunch of hassle with fixed wings to which servo goes to which output on the just, and the idea is that you just plug all your servos in and then you use this channel remapping function to rearrange the channels on the receiver. But you kind of could already do that just by changing the mixer, I guess. It turns out there's something Joshua doesn't know. Here's how you change the channel order on the receiver. And here's why it's better than just like, oh, I'm just gonna read you the mixer. What you're gonna do is you're gonna press menu, page, and go up to here, receiver one, RXSR is bound, long press, and you get the options and we'll choose options. And we can change the channel order and here's why it matters. If we change the channel order on the receiver, then when we rebind the receiver to other uh, transmitters, we don't need to also change. Let's say I've got all my transmitters set up with the same mixer, like uh, channel one is the throttle, channel two is the aileron, whatever, right? But then I wired up my receiver wrong, oops. Or I set up my quadcopter wrong, oops. By reordering the channels on the receiver, when I then go and bind the receiver to other transmitters, they will have the correct channel order. We correct the problem at the source and that's pretty cool. So this is where we can choose to, uh, pin one is channel one, pin two is channel two, but we can just change these to output whatever it is that we wanna output. Is it like, aw oh, darn. In Crossfire, you this is where you can have a channel output RSSI or LQ. It doesn't look like that is an option on this guy. The Access Protocol's Trio Control feature lets you bind up to three receivers to the same transmitter model at the same time. And this is something you can do right now with D16. You can bind as many receivers as you want uh, as long as you're only actually flying one of them at a time. D16 also allows you to do redundancy. You can have multiple receivers bound at the same time. And for example, on the RXSR, you can use the SBUS out wire from one receiver to the SBUS in wire on the next one, and you'll have redundancy. What Trio Control brings to the table is, number one, it's just more, it's more organized. The receivers know that there are three of them and they're all sort of sharing the air in an intelligent way. And that means that you can get telemetry from each of the receivers, which is something that you can't do with the D16 protocol. With the D16 protocol, if you bind three receivers and have them all turned on at the same time, only one of them can send telemetry back to the radio. Otherwise, they will interfere with each other and they'll get telemetry lost warnings, I guess. I've never done it. 
With Trio Control, you can have three active redundant receivers all sending telemetry and it allows sort of full redundancy with full functionality even after one of the receivers fails over. Finally, the Access Protocol brings spectrum management features to some but not all of the radios. The radios can act as a spectrum analyzer and a power meter. To get to the spectrum analyzer and the power meter, I'm going to long press to the left on the x -Lite Pro. That gets me to the radio setup menu, and then I'm going to click to the right until I see tools, and then I can go down and activate spectrum and see the spectrum analyzer. This is a 2.4 gigahertz spectrum analyzer only. It's not going to help you with your, with, your, with your FPV video, but there it is. You can see if there's any noise in the spectrum and if we just take the let's turn the uh let's turn the other guy on and see if we get anything oh yeah there we go you can see the other transmitter making some noise here the um the power meter i think is far more interesting frequency 900 2.4 only dang mm. yeah you can get a power meter oh there you go it's moving <laughs> Peak minus 2.4 dBm. How about that? Detect it. If you think you fried your freaking radio board, you could detect the reduction in power when your radio board or antenna is bad if you have more than one radio, I guess. Another feature that Access brings to the table, and this is a big one. This might be the biggest one. Should have put it first. <laughs> is over-the-air firmware updates. Right now, if you want to update the firmware on your FreeSky receiver, you need to plug it into the bottom of your transmitter or connect it to your computer using a USB adapter or serial pass-through on your flight controller. All of this is an enormous pain in the butt. If you flash from the transmitter, you got to unplug the receiver from the quad. What if I direct soldered it? Too bad, so sad. If you use serial pass-through, it's a, just a... It, Flashing over the air may be the single best thing that FreeSky Crossfire gave us, and I am comparing that to the awesome range and reliability of the link. <sighs> over the air firmware updates are amazing, and I'm super excited that Access is bringing this to FreeSky. Now that you know what FreeSky Access is and basically how to use it, we're done with the video. If you decide that you are going to buy one of these radios, can I just take one second and ask you to use one of the affiliate links down in the video description. You click one of those links and you buy one of these radios or you buy anything after clicking one of those affiliate links and I get a small commission. It's one of the ways I support myself. It doesn't cost you anything. Just go click those links before you do any shopping. But I got links to these radios down there just because that's what we're talking about in this radio. And if Free Sky Access isn't for you, man, I've tried to keep politics and editorializing out of this video and just keep it focused on the technical, but... For some of you guys, you're like, BFD, my radio is perfectly good the way it is. I don't have any problems with D16 protocol. I don't need no stupid 24 channels. I, I say that all with a crossfire module in the back of my radio. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if Free Sky Access is not for you, I, I don't blame you because these two radios... The X-Lite's a good radio, but I don't love the form factor, and the and the X9 Lite is a really low-end radio. I would like a better radio, and I wouldn't buy it as of today. But if I were a beginner, let's get back on message. If I were a beginner, I, I would definitely be looking at something like the X9 Lite. You don't have to use Access if you don't want to, but it's still a pretty solid radio. And the X-Lite Pro, a lot of people, a lot of people love the X-Lite. Personally, the form factor doesn't work for me, but it's a really solid radio. And if you love the X-Lite, then the X-Lite Pro is just more of what you love. So there you go. That's going to do it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Look for more Free Sky Access uh, content on my channel coming soon, including how to update the firmware, how to update the firmware on the X9 Lite to support the ACCST protocol. It doesn't actually do that out of the box. Then people screamed about it and Free Sky conceded. So yeah, look for more content coming up on the channel. That's going to do it for today. Happy flying, everybody. Uh -huh.